Patricia Becker-Ramdan, and I am a clinical research fellow here at Seattle Science Foundation. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about a rare congenital anomaly called the split atlas. So before we actually go into the split atlas, let's just talk about the normal anatomy of the atlas. So the atlas is also called your first cervical vertebra, also known as C1, and its main function is to support the weight of the skull as well as to allow a great degree of movement between your head and your neck at your atlanto-occipital joint. So if we look at this schematic drawing of the atlas, you would see it's classically ring-shaped, and what makes this bone unique is that it lacks a vertebral body or body compared to the rest of the vertebra. So if you look here, you have your lateral masses, which extends anteriorly to give you your anterior arches. And your anterior arches are typically more thicker and shorter when, com oh, sorry. when compared to your posterior arches, which are more thinner and longer. And then you have your posterior tubercle here. And then what extends from the, from laterally from your lateral masses would be your transverse process. And that encloses your transverse foramen in which your vertebral arteries, and your sympathetic nerves and your venous plexuses run through. And then here you have this wide ring shape, which is basically your vertebral foramen. And if you could kind of imagine a transverse uh, ligament of your atlas running around here, it would slightly divide your, this ring into a smaller anterior part in which it occupies the dens of the axis, whereas the most uh, posterior larger part is where your spinal cord runs. So let's go a little bit into embryology and development of your atlas. So normally you have three uh, ossification centers, primary ossification centers. Two are located laterally and one is anteriorly. So if you look in this picture here, these little purple dots, you see a ossification center in each lateral mass. And at around the seventh week of gestation, it's going to grow dorsally like this, and it's going to give you your posterior arch. And you can tell it's your posterior arch compared to here because it's longer and thinner, whereas this is shorter and thicker. And so at birth, it doesn't completely fuse. There's going to be like a narrow segment of uh, cartilage. And only at when the patient reaches about three to five years of age, it's going to completely fuse and form a union. So if you don't have fusion of this region, um, it's going to result in a cleft in your posterior arch. So you'll have an abnormality there. On the other hand, you have your anterior arch right here. Um, but at birth, this whole region is made up of fibrocartilage. So at around the end of your first year of life, you're going to have a ossification center that develops right in this region on the anterior aspect. And then it's going to grow kind of laterally towards your lateral masses, and you'll expect it to fuse at about the, uh, between seven to 10 years of age. So failure to form this ossification center or failure to fuse with the lateral masses could result in uh, a cleft in the anterior arch. And then um, in some studies, they stated that how there could be a fourth ossification center in a small subset of patients, which is found directly in the posterior midline. So you can see it here, and this is going to give rise to your posterior tubercle, which is which, which is supposed to happen at the second day of life. So now let's get a little bit into split atlas. So another name is called bipartite atlas, and it is a rare congenital abnormality where you don't have fusion of your anterior and your posterior arches. So therefore you get like a cleft in both your anterior and your posterior arch, and that's called a complete bipartition, and it occurs only in about 0.1% of the population. But more commonly, you have variations that are very similar to this, but it just has an isolated arch cleft in the posterior region or in the anterior region. And the posterior region is more common and can occur up to 5% of patients, whereas in the anterior arch cleft, it can occur between 0.1 and 0.7% of patients. So it's unclear whether the split atlas normally has any hereditary component to it. But in the literature that I reviewed, um, we came across two documents well, two reports are documented uh, a case between a mother and a son and a mother and a daughter. So you can have two different anomalies that can develop from the posterior arch defects. So you could have median clefts or you can have, um, you can have degrees of, varying degrees of aplasia of your posterior arch. So this is a classification system that was used 
quite often in the literature. So it's basically subdivided into five different types. So type A, you could see that how the hemiarches did not fuse at the midline, and it's the most common out of the five. It occurs in about 97% of the population, whereas these would account for the remaining 3%. So in the B, you see that there's a cleft on one side of the, uh, of the posterior arch. In type C, you have a cleft on both sides, leaving a posterior osseous fragment here. Um, type D, you're also going to have just the posterior tubercle and absence of the complete posterior arches. And then type E, you're going to have absence of both the posterior tubercle and the entire arch. So how does this present? So most of these really occur, really are symptomatic. And you tend to just find it incidentally when you do a imaging procedure for some, whether the patient had a major traumatic accident, you tend to just see it on imaging. Or you sometimes you see it on when you wake up for cervical pain, they tend to see this with atlas. Um, sometimes in traumatic cases, patients could present with chronic neck pain, um, neurological symptoms like quadriparesis, paraparesis, headaches, and limit sign. So type C and D, if you remember here, they both contain like a posterior osseous fragment or a posterior tubercle. And basically this is clinically significant because in these patients, um, when you have this isolated tubercle, um, when you extend your neck, yeah, when you extend your neck, the, the fragment could actually displace forward and then it could interact with the spinal cord producing neurological symptoms. Um, okay. So there have been some associations with uh, spit atlas and some congenital disorders such as Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, um, Klippel field syndrome, which is basically you have fusion of at least two or more cervical uh, vertebra, Chiari malformation, um, which is when you have a herniation of your cerebellum into your foramen magnum, um, gonadal dysgenesis, where you have loss of germ cells in the, uh, in the gonads of during embryogenesis. And there was one case report that, uh, that reported a coexistence of spit atlas with thalassemia minor. So what they were saying here is that there's a relationship between split atlas and congenital diseases um, that have an impact on your connective tissue development, um, which could result in ligamentous lax laxity. So this theory attributes that the ligamentous laxity can cause a greater range of movement um, in utero, and then that could lead to failure of fusion of your arches. So when I was going through the literature, they had a lot of articles that differentiated between Jefferson's fracture and split atlas. So a lot of, uh, so about maybe 10% of your cervical spine fractures are fractures related to the atlas. And from that 10%, about one third are actually Jefferson's fracture, which is a fracture of both the anterior and the posterior um, arches. So they can actually present similarly to split atlas if split atlas was symptomatic, such as chronic neck pain or any stiffness or headaches. So if you were to try to differentiate between split atlas and Jefferson's fracture or an imaging, this two uh, schematic drawings kind of illustrates it perfectly, where you see that the clefts in the split atlas tend to be in the midline, whereas in the fracture, it tends to occur on the lateral aspects of the arches. As well as if you look at the actual clefts in split atlas, it's very smooth rounded, well, smooth, smooth. And um, it's actually lined by cortical bone, Whereas in Jefferson's fracture, you tend to see it very irregular and sharp, and it has a cortical bone defect. And lastly, if you were to look in actual imaging uh, images, you would see that how there's uh, edema and swelling of the soft tissue surrounding the fracture because of trauma, whereas in split atlas, they would not have any swelling or uh, edema. So how do you diagnose this condition? So like I said before, you tend to just find it incidentally when you do an imaging uh, study for maybe acute trauma or maybe cervical neck pain or some reason. But if you were to really diagnose it, the gold standard is to do a CT scan with a transverse view. Uh, many patients come in for trauma and they tend to do open mouth and lateral cervical x-rays. So they, tend to, they say that how the anterior clefts are more readily and easily detected by an open mouth um, odontoid view versus a posterior defect, which is more seen on the lateral radiographs. 
Um, and then if you want to access atlanto axial instability, you would do a 3D CT reconstruction of the cervical vertebra. And if there is neurological uh, defects present on physical exam, then you'd want to do a T1 weighted MRI. So how do you manage a, a split atlas? So most patients are asymptomatic, so really no treatment is required. But if the patient does have chronic cervical pain, you could do, you could do a, an anti-inflammatory medications like NSAIDs, or you could try to immobilize the cervical region with a cervical collar or a halo, a halo uh, ring. But I think the main thing they want you to get away from this is you need to assess if there is atlantoaxial instability because then you'd have to do a 3T CT reconstruction, as mentioned prior, and then you have to do operative measures because with this instability, any little minor trauma could actually displ displace the displace, um, cause dislocation at the atlantoaxial level. And then you could get significant stenosis of the spinal canal, which is very life-threatening. So some operative measures they use for an anterior approach to correct the anterior arch defect. Um, it occurs transorally, and the advantages are that it fixes the midline cleft as you would like, but it also preserves rotary function of the rotatory function of the neck and the joints of the atlas, and it does not leave a visible scar on the body. Whereas in the posterior approach for the posterior arch defects, it fixes congenital, it fixes the cleft and it uh, gives stability to the atlantoaxial joint. But disadvantages of the posterior one would be that it, it causes fusion. Um, the fusion restricts rotatory function of the neck, thereby diminishing its function. Whereas a disadvantage of the anterior is because you're doing a transoral approach, you have a risk of infection or of pharyngeal infections. And that's it. Thank you.